We have uh, two, I, I want to first start with the two short films, which I absolutely loved, uh, both of them so much. So um, why don't we, uh, Beth, we'll wait to, to sort of do your shindig at the end. So um, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your film. Um, I guess the question I would first ask both of you is, of course, I mean, these two, the character in, um, the characters in both were so unique and wonderful. I'm wondering if you found these people somehow, walking around town or something. How did you, how did you discover these, these unique, quirky, fabulous people? So tell us which movie you did and um, just a little bit about how you decided to make the movie. Hi, I'm Isabel Dunn. I directed, produced, and edited Once and Again. Um, I guess through some friends of friends, I was invited to join uh, Jim Cartwright, the oldest subject in my film. He throws a party every year celebrating Thomas Edison's birthday. <laughs> so, uh, of course. So, um, at this party, uh, Lewis was my guest. Lewis uh, is the one with the large phonograph horn. Um, and it was my host, rather. I was his guest, and we, we went to the party. I met Amelia, met Jim. Uh, the phonograph gallery in the final sequence of the film and the large phonograph uh, record collection, uh, the sort of the hallway, the archive, uh, are both in Jim's home. So I entered that space and just immediately knew I had to get to know these people better um, and uh, was just captivated, felt like I'd entered another century and wanted to capture that magic, that beauty on film. Um, my name is Melissa McClung, and I uh, filmed and directed and edited Louis Antiques. And it was exactly that. I just walked into a store, and he was ready to be on camera. <laughs> and um, I fell in love with him. And so I shot with him um, just on my spare time over about, um, I would say, uh, 10 uh, days and over six months. And, and we just, our relationship grew, and it was really one of the first times that I uh, really had a, a relationship with the subject, and, I, and we're still, I call him, I called him yesterday to tell him that I was introducing him to a whole new group of people, so it was, it was really, really fun to get to know him. Great. Um, so for once and again, um, I, one of the most interesting and really beautiful moments of that film is you you, the camera staying on him, listening to that piece of music at the end. Um, and first of all, as a filmmaker myself, it's hard to do that because your feeling is, oh my God, are people going to stay for, what was it, three minutes? Four. Okay. <laughs> Including him setting it up. <laughs> yeah, four minutes. Um, and you just kept the camera going. And I thought, I don't know how people here felt, but I thought it was really beautiful. And I guess I'm just wondering how you came to that moment, how he, how you got him to a place where he didn't feel self-conscious to sort of react to the music in that way. Um, just a little bit about that. Of course. Um, well, Lewis is just incredible and so open. Um, from day one, uh, we had these one-on-one -on -one audio interviews first. I was very I, I was very careful about bringing in camera, lights, you know, just any recording uh, at, at all. Um, I wanted to really get to know each of them first because I did want to capture this very intimate thing of listening to music. A lot of times we listen, you know, out in public, we're at concerts, that's one way of listening. But then there's those moments when it's just you and you're connecting with the music. So. Um, to really capture the truth of that, I, I had to ease in with, with each of them. And so with Lewis, um, I was able in our audio interview that we did um, about a month before the shooting to um, listen to some records with him. And he responded that way to another record. And we shared this moment together where I was at the verge of tears myself because it was this gorgeous, this gorgeous um, piece. And, it was a different record, but it was um, it was this moment where I could tell that he understood that I understood, and that was really important for him. Um, he's really sweet when he tells this story about me uh, as well, so it's always great to have him here, and I'm missing him here today, because um, he's incredible, but we had that moment, and then I was very careful 
in the listening shot to minimize crew in the in the space of his home. So um, we just had a couple sound recordists off to the side to the left in a little a uh, little hallway off to the side. Me and my cinematographer Carlo to my side, and it was just us and. Uh, had everyone else, all two or three others, because it was a very small crew, out on the front porch, and they didn't even know the magic that had happened inside until later. Um, but as that moment unfurled, it was a surprise to me, honestly, because I, I knew that it was something he was capable of, of, of doing, of, of demonstrating, um, and that he was capable of that vulnerability, that honesty, but it wasn't something that I expected or asked of him to show the world. Um, but what ended up happening was I said, Lewis, why don't you put on two or three records and just let them play out, you know, listen, sit down in the chair, just listen. We're, we're going for this, this shot of you listening. Um, do with it what you will. And so he listened to two full uh, records. We basically just were, had this 12 minute take going at this point and then he goes up to switch the, the record, set it up, and then that shot happens. The, what, the moment I knew that something had changed was I'd originally said, just, you know, put it on, sit down. But whenever he put that record on, as you saw, he takes his jacket off. He's going off book now. And I knew something was bound to happen, so wow. Okay, he takes the coat off, he moves the cactus so that it's perfectly, just the composition is just, whoa. And so he just, he, he just had a, you know, also this, this sense of, this stage presence as well. This, he knew what he was doing. He, he surprised me and that was really a gift that he gave me in the film and, and really capturing also this idea of what we can focus, the extent to which we can focus on something. So right before that shot, he says, you know, I can only focus on something for four minutes. And that take actually continues because the piece itself is four minutes, but his setup is an additional minute. So originally I had him listening to the full piece. There's a bit of a denouement, a continu continuation of the piece. But I was like, this, fe this is feeling too long and I don't know why. It was really interesting. It was because the shot, the take, was five minutes at that point. He's on to something with this four minutes because the <laughs> second I cut it at four minutes, that moment, and then trail out with his sort of outro is what really just, it. I don't, I don't, the, the piece, the, the sort of truth of the medium of the phonograph recording length just helped me, led me to that, you know, that edit point. It was incredible. Yeah, well, very brave for you to hang in there. It was, it was a, just a beautiful culmination of everything. And of course, I loved the gal. She was just, oh my God, what a character. It was very cool. All right, so creepy, weird, awesome and a little bit of animation in there too. So just sort of talk a little bit about, you know, when you first walked into that antique shop, I mean, did you sort of get a, a sense of how you wanted to shoot this little film and, and how did you go with it? And how long was your shoot? Uh, uh, well, okay. <laughs> uh, so I, um, I was really drawn to the antique shop because it was so uncurated. Um, so other antique shops in town were sort of like had on display what's the, the good things in the shop. And this was like just piles of strange objects. And I really loved that about that. I thought that was really magical. It felt like a portal to another world uh, to me. And so what was really wonderful about this project is it felt really organic. I went in and the first few shoots I did with him, he really wanted to tell his stories. And so I... Um, so I listened through that, and then slowly but surely, something started emerging with the objects, and um, that's what really drew me in. So I have a lot of him telling his biography, or his autobiography, everything like that, but something about the objects really um, excited me. And so then I um, got the idea to start playing myself with the objects. And you can see I'm not an animator. Now I work with some animators, but, um, it was just it was just such a joy and it was so fun to be playful um, with everything in the shop. And the thing about the shop is objects don't move from there very often. <laughs> so I would come back a few months later and the same turtle would still be there. <laughs> and um, so I was able to edit and then and then and then go and shoot something else, so kind of cater 
um, my next shoot to what I was missing in the edit. Okay, beautiful. Um, well, first of all, as young filmmakers, you're these short films. Short films sometimes are harder to make than feature films, and you did both a beautiful, beautiful job. And I hope we continue to see you making movies. And they were both beautifully shot, by the way. Gorgeous. Um, just beautiful composition and everything. So, fantastic. Um, thank you, Brian. All right. So, um, I'm going to just talk to Beth a little bit about um, the feature film. And then we'll open it up for conversation. So, Beth, this is, first of all, is this your third time back to Middlebury or your second? My third. Oh, okay. So, yay. She's Thank you. Love. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I've seen the film now twice, Made in Boise. Um, I guess, you know, my first question again is why this film? Did you hear about this? Were you interested in surrogates? How did you first get interested in making this movie? Um, so, I'm the producer of the film. Um, so, I'm going to speak a little bit for Beth Ala. Uh, Beth is the director. She's so basically, um, well, we have our own funny story, which is that I used to work at HBO. When I went on maternity leave, Beth was my replacement. And it was really easy for everybody at HBO because I could just keep talking to Beth. <laughs> A couple years later, when Beth went on maternity leave, I was her maternity replacement. So we've always had this bond around like birth and, and, and children, I guess. So, um, a few, years, a few years after she had her second child, her really good friend asked her to carry a baby, her baby for her. Her friend couldn't have children of her own. And Beth sort of loved this friend and said she would do it, um, even though she really didn't want to. And then luckily the friend got pregnant on her own. A few months later, so Beth sort of had this first um, exposure to surrogacy in a way. And then a few months later, her best friend from college was visiting, who's a nurse at St. Luke's, and was and started talking about how all the nurses are at St. at St. Luke's are having children for others that they're working or that they're doing the surrogacy. Uh, it's actually not considered work in the in the parlance of the industry, so it's considered a service. So, um, so Beth had just kind of had her own experience, and she said, "What are you talking about?" And Beth went out to Boise to sort of see for herself, met Nicole. Um, they really hit it off. Beth was fascinated and questioning the whole thing. And that was really the beginning of the, that, the journey of this film. Um, that was in 2016. And Beth approached me to help her with the film. It's, it's her directorial debut as, uh, um, as an independent filmmaker. Um, I've made a couple of films, and um, I, I was very, um, my dad is an OBGYN, a very classic, uh, old school OBGYN, and I, I, I was really, and, I, and I, I have feminist <laughs> leanings, and I was really uncertain about the film for a long time, and so I c consulted with her, um, and then as I started to see the film come together, I felt like it raised actually some really complex questions. Um, and so I decided to formally come on board in 2017. So still two years ago. Yeah. I mean, um, I found the film absolutely fascinating. It, it, it has many different levels and a lot of questions. I mean, the first thing, I, I have a son, I gave birth. The first thing I was like, are you freaking kidding me? These women have six, five, four, you know what? They just love being pregnant. They love giving birth. I mean, that was just wild for me um, to find out that there were women out there who just wanted to keep doing this, you know? I mean, it was like, oh my God. I mean, obviously childbirth is wonderful and all that stuff, but you know, it's also, you know, extremely difficult. Um, so that was really uh, fascinating for me. Um, the other thing that I guess I want you to talk about, if you want to comment on what I just said too, but you know, I think this idea of, and I thought the woman really answered it well about getting paid, you know, and that people have sort of, I think, can sort of look at women and say, oh, this is just a gig, you know, you're just getting paid, and obviously you get paid pretty well, 120,000, is that what it was approximately, or? They make about twenty five. So they the make whole 25. thing okay. can cost upwards of a hundred and twenty thousand, hundred, hundred and twenty. They get on average about twenty five. It depends okay. if they're 
having one child or twins, which is now discouraged, um, C-section or not, whether they'll continue to deliver breast milk or not. So there's, there's a whole menu. But I mean, my feeling was, of course they should get paid. You know, that's my feeling. It was like, my God, if they're going to do this, why not get paid? Um, and, and, and I liked the woman who said, yeah, this is really important for me to have this extra income. You know, I'm doing this out of my heart, which you felt from every one of these women. But I guess just talk a little bit about what, a little bit more about what your controversy was around it, what you learned from making the movie, and some of these things that, you know, I think people sort of raise their eyebrows brows at. Um, well, I think it's a really uncomfortable subject matter in a way. I mean, these are women who are having babies for other people. So, um, inherently there are so many questions about the medical ethics, the legal ethics, the bioethics. Um, in terms, so it's, it's, there's a lot to, I think, unpack. I think that there wasn't a controversy for us in making the film, but I think that we wanted to make the film to raise the questions and, and just kind of have the dialogue. I think that the film challenges our notions about who these surrogates are why and why they do it. Um, some women really do do it more for the money, like Sammy, and yet there is Chelsea who had this real unresolved emotional issue around a stillbirth and, and this is a way where she found a way to heal. So I think it, it, it I think um, different women have different reasons for doing it. They have their own narratives. I think it challenges our own ideas about why and it also challenges, you know, raises this question about, you know, who can have biological children of their own and how and um, it's, a, it's a slippery slope in some ways, you know, um, I think we're going to see children being born in, in all different kinds of ways in the future, and, and this is a, a kind of a first, first layer. And it is interesting how, you know, maybe, um, you know, 25 years ago, in vitro was deemed as sort of, you know, that was unsettling for people. That's certainly far more normal. So what's going to happen here i don't know but i think it's going to keep happening and if it's going to keep happening then we need to have a discussion about how is it happening is it how should it be regulated or not how do we deal with it ethically medically legally um because it's it's going to continue to happen um so yeah i mean to me what was so beautiful about the film is for me the film in some ways the theme was that families can be so many things. It's not the typical family anymore. For you know? sure. And that you just saw that. You know, you saw these women um, being so generous with their bodies and with their emotional ties. Um, but these, the people, at least the people that in this film, who were the parents who were walking away with the children, were so lovely and wonderful and grateful and. You just thought this little baby's gonna have a wonderful extended family, you know? Um, so that was really great to see. Um, why is New York not, uh, I mean, it's odd to me that New York, of all states, um, you, it, this is illegal. I mean, any thoughts on that? And are they moving in any, I mean, getting closer to being legal? Uh, so the Baby M case that's referenced in the film, that really had a really strong reverberation in New York State, and so Governor Cuomo at the time illegalized um, surrogacy. There was so much outrage over it. So now, really interestingly, Governor Cuomo's son is now governor of the state of New York, and so um, he presented a bill to um, legalize surrogacy. Um, it was not decided, so when the assembly opens in January of 2020, it's going to be raised again. Um, so um, there's been a lot of press about it. Uh, there was in about June of this year um, with Gloria Steinem, so, you know, speaking out about it. it was the, there were articles in the New York Times and the press, and so it's a, uh, it's uh, you know, it's controversial. But it's funny when Beth first pitched this movie to me. To work on this, um, she said, um, I said, well, what is, like, in your mind, what's the movie about? And she said, inclusion. Mm. And I was like, inclusion? And in the early, and in our early pitches, 
it really wasn't landing, and we really steered away from that, um, that it's about other things. But now that the film is done, I sort of smile to myself because in my own way, I do think that it's a film about inclusion and that explores inclusion. Um, so uh, these issues around inclusion are, can be really divisive. Um, I guess another question I would say is, uh, can, I mean, it costs money to do this. So, I mean, can low-income women have access to this kind of thing? I mean, are there cheaper ways of, I mean, what, what, how, because, I mean, if it's costing $120,000 in total, that's a lot of money. So any, um, any thoughts on that? I don't really have thoughts, but I, I, I mean, clearly privilege is a piece yeah. of the puzzle, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, at least, at least currently. At, at least, least currently. currently. Yeah. yeah. As and as far as I understand, yeah. And this film is um, premiering on Independent Lens, correct? On PBS, or it's about to? Or yeah, it's super exciting. It's the series opener for Independent Lens, so it'll be on October twenty eighth, Monday, ten p.m. Um, on all stations nationwide. And what's really cool, I think, too, is that. Um, it is streaming in Asia. Uh, there's a platform called Gaga Ulala, and um, it's the gay Netflix of Asia. And so it'll be streaming on Gaga Ulala, and then we're working to, you know, exploit all other platforms and stuff. But yes, so it'll be on Independent Lens in October. Yeah, it's really interesting also just that Europe, so much of Europe is doesn't do this. Uh, I don't know, I would have thought that they would be way more liberal than we were, but whatever. Um, that's interesting. So good. I hope they see it. All right. Let's open it up to questions. Yes, back there. Um, hi, Beth. So a question for you is, you kind of alluded to it in the movie and talking about it being about inclusion, but it sounded like many of the surrogates were Catholic or Mormons and, and not necessarily welcoming of gay marriage, and yet they're doing this for oftentimes people who are gay. So I was curious about, you know, um, what was really happening there and did it really help people to expand their own viewpoints? Or was it already people who were already open who would do it? Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a little bit of, like, um, it started happening, maybe people weren't so open to it, then they choose to carry for gay couples, then it changes the culture a little bit, then more people do it. So, you know, what's interesting about Idaho is Idaho's a red state, pretty red state. Boise's a blue bubble, but whenever you have those blue bubbles, you know, around the, the, the perimeter of the bubble, you know, it's, well, all throughout, you know, it's mixed. So I just, I think it's, it's, it's um, there's definitely, um, there's a culture there where the practice has become increasingly accepted and certainly, you know, Nicole, as she says, 70% of her clients are, you know, gay men from overseas. You know, we also know that, you know, she herself says that she carried for a lesbian couple. So I think it's kind of worked both ways to, um, pe to for, for people to question maybe what they what they think or what they believe. So it's, it's had an interesting impact on the community kind of both ways, for both those who, who care, for those who carry, for their families, and for the larger community. But it is ironic because you would think that like, you know, New York City would be the capital of doing this because they're so diverse and so progressive and so, but here it is in Boise, Idaho, you know, where it's pretty conservative. I mean, even if it's a blue bubble, and yet they're doing all these, you know, they're, they're Connecting with all of these different kinds of family dynamics, but they had this. The, they had a perfect, you know. Basically, it's it started happening there. I think because of the community and the culture, women are there used to having more babies and more pregnancies. Then what ended up happening was that the hospital responded, and the hospital really did create this program that is singular in the country. And then the legal system and the support system and the larger system developed around it, and then the larger culture became more accepting. So you had all these ways in which um, it, it could really uh, it could really happen there. Yeah. Okay. Down here. I, I was uh, there's only one thing missing from this movie for me, so maybe it can be 
talked about in uh, supplemental materials or something. But I, I felt like uh, we didn't hear from Nicole about the process of how they, I know that she's desperate to have more people because she's got so many clients coming. How does she uh, vet the women? And I didn't feel there was enough on the vetting process mm -hmm. because to me, that's the, that, to me that's the biggest question here. You have a woman who's had a previous C-section. You have another woman who's a very difficult pregnancy and then something bad went to happen with her uterus. Are these really uh, healthy candidates for this? And so those kind of questions were not answered enough for me. And it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be or that they weren't, they didn't come to the conclusion that they would be, but it's still, it's still scary for me that, um, that I didn't see the vetting process. I saw her actively looking for more women in that kind of very aggressive way, not in a terrible way, but a very like active way, but not enough of the vetting process. And that vetting process is to me like the linchpin of whether this is okay or not, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. Um, you know, I do know, well, this is where it gets to be sort of a slippery slope when something becomes an industry, right? right. So um, I do know that, for example, all the surrogates, they have to go through psychiatric and a psychological evaluation, and that's dictated by the uh, association um, ASRM. I can't remember what the S stands for, but it's, it's uh, Amer American Society of Reproductive Medicine. So they dictate that um, a, a psychological psychiatric evaluation has to be done. Um, technically, all of these women, as I understand, also need to receive permission from their doctors, but as you saw in the film, Cindy went ahead and did it, and the doctor found out after the fact. So, you know, it, the, I, I, think it's, I think it's not currently in the film. I think every film suffers from of course, of course. what do you include and what don't you, but I, I, I totally appreciate the comment. I mean, and I'm an editor, so I understand how things get cut, and why they cut, or not happen. But yeah. to me, I would love to hear more about that, and that would be a great like uh, news story about your movie. Yeah. You know, how to yeah. supplement what's missing to help us better holistically understand the entire process. Yeah. And cool. I, yeah. Good question. Back here. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I was curious. It seemed like it was a Catholic hospital that was sponsoring this. Sounds, Sounds right to me. Uh, but my, my same question is, uh, the, the, the four or five stories told were wonderfully compelling. And I'm wondering, how representative were they of the totality of the 80 to 100 um, pregnancies that this agency uh, ran? And do, do, do we assume correctly that it's all wonderful, like these four or five stories? Yeah, I mean, the film is a representative sample, right? So, um, in terms of everything that we know, I mean, there was, um, there was a child that died through surrogacy a few years ago. So that did happen in Boise. But otherwise, and this is all just sort of experiential and from our conversations with Nicole and the hospital and the doctors, but for the most part, it has been a pretty positive experience, which is why it's mushrooming in, in, in Boise. You know, I think that the women and the families are getting good care at the hospital because the hospital is prepared to take care of these women. They have figured it out legally. Um, so I, I do, you know, so from what we know, I think it's fairly representative. But I, at the same time, I can't say that we've, this wasn't an investigative film where we kind of then went and, and also kind of uncovered all this other stuff. So, um, so it, that's what's kind of um, fascinating and perhaps unsettling is that it, 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 this is somewhat representative and the women did have their struggles, you know? I mean, Cindy's on bed rest and, and it got very dangerous and Chelsea ends up having a blood clot, so they're not perfect pregnancies. Um, and, and it was important for us that they also weren't perfect pregnancies. And a couple of the, the parents talked about how they tried this before and it didn't work. So obviously there's a hit and miss thing and it may not work the first time and this was something, in some cases, weren't the two gay guys like their second time or something at least? 
So obviously, I'm sure it doesn't always like work out perfectly the first time, but good question. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, I, and thank you so much. And uh, Made in Boise, um, uh, it is inviting, I think, and I love the educational piece of a new, a unique families. But I also really welcomed um, and want to know more about um, the representation of not just the men who were the intended parents, but men in general, whether they were the fathers of the um, surrogates or whether they were the best friends or whether they were the cousin in Taiwan. Just the educational piece of skin to skin and what it's like for them, but for a unique community where we're learning about what it's like for, for men as well. Yeah, we sort of laugh, but the men stole the show in their own way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, a couple more questions. I can't answer that question, but um, I think it is such a long and I, anyway. I can't answer that question exactly. That's a wrinkle in um, in Idaho law that I just I'm sorry I can't answer that question. <laughs> They talked about that in yeah. the movie. Yeah. No, they, 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 it's, they have to take the baby. It's their child. It's genetically their child. It, yeah. Okay, one more question. I have a question. I, I love the movie. It brought off, it, it showed all these complex issues relative to privilege. I loved how visually it was set in Boise and you saw these, these horrible suburban growth <laughs> areas with all these new babies that maybe we don't need. So you dealt with privilege in this visual way, yes. and it was just beautiful. Uh, really, really stunning. Um, well, I'll let Beth know. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing that was pretty funny is her, her director's statement is, um, I've always loved her artistic and director statement because uh, Beth started out as a painter, so composition was really important to her. But she was also really fast, we were very inspired by the Truman Show, where, you know, it's sort of like it looks so suburban and normal, and yet under the surface there's something kind of unusual going on here. So there was a real effort to draw on some cinematic language to kind of convey, convey these ideas, even if they're operating, you know, below the surface. So. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Go have lunch. Go to your next movie. These people will be here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.